Hi guys, I'm Danny Castellano and this is Diet Culture. Today I'm joined by Nick Lewis and we are talking about why diet culture needs to be taken down. Some really important key topics like health at every size, socioeconomic determinants of health, the ways in which diet culture plays into our day-to-day lives that sometimes we don't even recognize because it's just so inherent and systemic and it's just there. We're talking about other forms of oppression and how it takes a lot of Um, pause and growth and work to start to see that these things need to be changed and just having open conversation about all of this to kind of introduce in a at a deeper level what this podcast is all about so I hope you enjoy episode one of diet culture hi I'm coming to you from my closet recording studio in Denver Colorado what's up Nick what's up Dan I'm coming from Centerville, Virginia. I'm in my, in my office in my regular space. So, but, but I'm excited to do this. Me too. I'm just going to dive right in. You've probably heard that diets don't work and they don't. Unfortunately, that hasn't been good enough for our fat phobic society. And therefore diets run rampant under the guise of quote unquote, wellness, health, clean eating, intuitive eating, etc. Promising that if you put the right foods into your body and never overeat and work out enough that you will obtain the body you desire. Um, Said body varies, but there's an overarching message that we receive daily that being fat makes you not good enough. I want to talk about the influence that diet culture um has like all around us that sometimes isn't even like boom in your face. Um, It's not always like a Weight Watchers ad, which is very clearly diet culture. There's so much of it. Um, We'll start with media, television. Something probably blatantly obvious um, is that most people on television are thin. Oftentimes, like right now, and this is not to like put down any shows. It's just a straight up observation that we're watching One Tree Hill and most of the actresses in that show are just like model thin, I would say, if that puts an image in most of our heads. Very, very, very thin. Um, And when they're not thin, there's often an entire storyline based around it because they can't just be existing as what is that face? No, I'm just agreeing. I just, oh, yeah. Maybe I necessarily didn't even think about that. And I'm just so, so I'll, I'll pick up off that. Go continue. Yeah. So you know what made me realize that? I was watching a documentary about Schitt's Creek and they got a ton of feedback that the way the story was written allowed gay people to exist and usually stories with lgbtq plus are about their trials and tribulations and schitt's creek is probably one of the first shows that david is just blatantly gay and he exists that way and everyone is completely accepting of it it's just a fact it's not part of his character arc it's not a it's not a mechanism to develop the plot in any yep. sense. He's just gay. Yep. And so that really got me thinking because it's really always bothered me in This Is Us how Kate, her life story is so much built around her binge eating because of her um, depression and her trauma from but I don't want to give any spoilers, just that part. And there was all these talks about her going to lose. She around her gonna lose, around how she's gonna lose the weight by the end of the show. And I think slowly they're starting to back down from this. It was a big thing when she wanted to get pregnant. She she was being targeted by that, um, by her doctors, but they've started to kind of back off a little bit. Um, But it was such a huge part of her character. And I think that's really unfair and so that's one way just one way that tv um perpetuates diet culture 
Then we have the commercials that come on, whether you're streaming Hulu or watching live television, which probably most of us are using using streaming services at this time. But there's a Corona commercial that sticks out in my mind that I've seen a lot where everyone's just like running around in their bathing suits and they are so thin and have that quote unquote ideal body and they're happy. And that tells me if I want to be happy, I need to run around half naked, looking perfect, drinking Corona. Like, I know I'm a grown woman and I can make my own choices, but that's the point. Like, they're doing this on purpose. And there's a reason they chose the people they chose because they want their product associated with the thin ideal. Um, resort commercials like Sandal, for example, like they're always like these like smoking hot, like ridiculous looking people that I've never actually encountered in my real life. I don't know what where they find these people. Um, so I guess if you want to go to a nice luxurious vacation, well, one, you need privilege for that. So I guess that all kind of comes together. Um, family commercials and like progressive, even when they're like in their Zoom meetings, you can tell they're all thin. Um, because Zoom's the new norm for commercials now for everything. Um, But yeah, they're all thin. So those are just like a couple that came to my mind when I was brainstorming for this episode. Um, And it's gross. It is very gross. Um, I was thinking about some, and the first that comes to my mind is The Office, which Mm. is, the, The Office is funny to me specifically because what they try to do is make fun of the things that are wrong, right? They try to like show what's, and yeah. satire off of it but then you know in a sense you kind of fall to you're just doing it but exactly so i think there are characters like kevin and phyllis I in know. which like oh my goodness like it's probably like 50 percent of the jokes uh yep. in the office involving those two characters are about their weight yeah um and stanley as well um and they're just constantly like you know reeling those characters um yeah that's not good and and it's exactly what you said where it's like they were cast for that like i haven't read you know what kevin's thing before but you know he none of those three characters are allowed to exist as just people they're right you know overweight bodies in the show yeah Um, and then the other one that i was going to mention is um seinfeld um and really any like 80s 90s like sitcom that we we've been like watching a few and they're like holy cow just like fat phobic jokes out the wazoo man and they're like some of them are like whoa like they're very alarming to me and i know it's we're 30 years past that but still you when you watch it and you go oh my gosh like you know every nobody nobody raised an eyebrow when i know we're watching the simpsons um, cause Matt's been watching them. And so for anyone who doesn't know, Matt is my husband. Um, and sometimes the fat phobia gets so loud that I get up and leave the room. Um, because it, it cause this is my thing. And like, I can't, I just can't, I can't deal the diet culture in that show. Like it, I mean, it's a lot of problems. The Simpsons is very problematic if we're talking about social justice. Um, and again, I think it's the same thing. It's on purpose. And then at the same time, you're just doing it. So it's, there's a, a an issue with that, but it's, yeah, same thing. So it's rampant um, in television and movies, of course, in movies, hardly ever do you see a main character be cast who's in an over um, weight body. Also, Another thing that listeners should know is that Nick is a film uh, major and he, what do you do, Nick? Uh, Well, right now I do um, media production for mostly government clients with a small production firm in um, DC. Um, So I, I've studied the analytical Mm -hmm. side of film for a few years and now I'm not in the narrative side of film, but I am constantly in uh, marketing, advertising and filming you know everyday people and actors yeah so he just has a really interesting lens on this subject matter that's a a bit unique um so um real quick i do want to come back um you said that diets do not work and i want um you to elaborate real quick on that and give me that statistic Mm. So 95 to 98% of the time, um, 
weight loss may happen and you will regain it. So that's the percentage. There's a database, the National Weight Registry, and I believe it only goes out for five years ahead of time and or continues for five years. So that's not like an indefinite period to actually say anything works. So weight loss is often very possible. It's just a matter of will you be able to keep it off? And I'm going to dig into this a little bit more um, and probably forever as we continue this podcast. But just because it works in the short term does not mean it's actually an effective, like, thing to implement behavior change and whatnot yeah um that's okay great so i just wanted you to uh comment on that and make sure everybody knew why diet yeah. don't work you know you may have a diet may have worked for you in the sense that it, you lost a few pounds and yeah. that was your intention but yeah know, that's a good point this is so so that's what we were talking about um piggybacking off of how much diet culture you see every day. We covered, you know, television pretty well. We covered movies. Well, we didn't like give specific examples, but I don't think we would need to reach too hard. No. Um, I just want to run through. I have like a long list. And so reel them off. I don't have to elaborate on all these, but just I'm going to just go through it. So magazines, um, specific thing is the shaming photos of celebrities who gain weight that are in every grocery checkout aisle. Um, Instagram, the advertisements, the before and after photos, the influencers who are being paid to promote thinness. Um, Facebook ads, and again, a lot of before and after photos and just talk of people post their photos of what they ate for dinner, wanting like praise for being healthy. Um Twitter, there's a lot of healthism. Um, just like I see a lot of conversations of people being like, don't promote obesity because someone said something about accepting larger bodies. Like that's the kind of thing. And they're like, that's. And so when someone says they're promoting obesity, they're saying you're not promoting health. And they're very and, wrong. And, and I'm going gonna... to touch on that later too. Yeah. So. That's a that's a big issue. And I'm sure there's more happening on Twitter. That's just a big thing that stands out in my mind that I notice. Um, podcasts, there's so many of them about weight loss. Um, there's ones about weight loss that talk about diet culture, which is really problematic um, because that shouldn't be co-opted into conversation. Um, food packaging. So like the blatant low calorie keto diet, Weight Watchers, Atkins. There's a box of um, frosted mini wheats. Matt eats cereal for breakfast, and I picked the box up just to like look at it, not the nutritionals, but something caught my eye. And on the back, it said that if you have this with a, gla a like a bowl of this with two percent milk, you're th like some percentage likely not to get hungry again for three and a half hours, and it's only two hundred and seventy calories if you eat what they're saying, and that's just. About to put that into perspective, I would never say that any meal under 400 calories, and that's like a bare minimum, is actually like even considered a meal. And so for them to like promote that, it's like, oh my gosh, it's literally everywhere. Um, the idea that sugar is addicting, which it's not. Um, and I will for sure be talking about that often because that is one of my largest diet culture pet peeves. Um, the BMI scale conversation. Um the use of the words overweight and obese. Um, and then you've got the lovely morbid obesity, which is probably the most problematic. Um, weight being a focus at the doctor's office. Um, even people going to get like allergy tested sometimes are asked to get on a scale. What that has to do with your allergies beats me. Um, contouring your face to slim it down. Um, I recently bought a facial roller because... I just was curious about it. And when I was watching the videos, a lot of them were like, oh, this is to keep your face looking slim and contoured. And I was like, well, that's not why I bought this. Um, it does help to depuff my eyes, though, especially <laughs> after I cry a lot. So that's OK. Um, spray tans, 
make you look thinner, cellulite cream, um, chairs, airplane seats, any seat being sized for thin people, um, size 14, 16s being the highest at many clothing stores. Um, high fashion is typically sized up two to four sizes from what we wear in the United States. So once you're past a size 10 to 12, you can't fit in those anymore, um, which is a very small percentage of people that can actually fit into um, fancy dresses like wedding dresses and bridesmaids dresses. Um, Just general conversation, like I guess people say like water cooler conversation at the office and just like in general, I feel fat today. No, I'm sorry. You don't feel fat. That's not a feeling. Um, Facetune and Photoshop, the number of downloads that Facetune has is absolutely terrifying. Um, I was so bad this weekend and had ice cream, pizza, insert whatever um, food that people think is ruining their lives. But it's like um, I hit the treadmill afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Or I earned this because I ran six miles. And it's like you want to tell people this because you get praised for it because our society is is diet culture. It is our society. Um, Praise for celebrities and all people losing weight. Um, Oh, you look great. Have you lost weight when you haven't seen someone in a while? Or just the the comments that get made when someone does gain weight or when someone's pregnant and they're like, oh, you have this perfect little baby bump. I couldn't even tell you were pregnant. That's saying you haven't gotten fat that's exactly what that means and then Um, what are the comments like after you have the baby within two months oh yeah yeah oh you snapped right back into your body I've never had kids so I haven't been subjected to this but just the comments that I hear um it's atrocious uh Adele and Rebel Wilson are celebrities who recently lost an extreme amount of weight and there has been Rebel Wilson suddenly is like all over television. She's in an Ollie commercial and she's got a brand new reality TV show, which I find really funny because suddenly she's gotten thinner and now she's become even more popular. Um, Models being predominantly emaciated, um, like Victoria's Secret. I do believe that they finally have gotten larger sizes available in their store, but historically their models um i mean there's a whole fashion show around it so i think that's pretty well known problem um cool sculpting tummy tucks then we have this completely barbaric practice of bariatric surgery um weight loss pills and supplements quote unquote diet foods in grocery stores i made a a reel about this recently because i was in a king supers which is like our version of kroger um out in colorado it's the same company. And there was a an aisle that was labeled diet food. And I, I lost my mind. So um, that gone much that you need to put it in one aisle? Continue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the need to have thigh gaps, hip dips, ab lines, um, and then, you know, good old eating disorders, which are not solely caused by diet culture, but very much something that perpetuates them. And the way that um, diets are promoted younger and younger and younger and passed on through generations. Definitely, if you are predisposed to having an eating disorder, um, really um, exacerbate it. Yeah. um, I would like to come back to the television set one more time and talk about uh, a whole lot of shows that are very specifically diet oriented shows or shows to critique and examine the life of an overweight body as if it oh my was gosh a national geographic alligator in the wild um my 600 I can't believe pound I didn't... life is like what is there a show called my thin white life where you just like sit there and everything works for you like well no. that's just the other shows that aren't my 600 pound life yeah yeah no you're you're right <laughs> But no, like my 600 pound life, that to me, that, that I hope that soon we can look at the title of that show and all cry. Um, the Biggest Loser, which is like, that show is kind of obscenely offensive. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say about this, Danielle. I do. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you a second ago. I just can't believe that I didn't think about it. I think because I purposely try not to 
to think about <laughs> these things um because i'm like about to burst into flames right now um so making a television show out of weight loss is <sighs> you know what i hate it i hate it so much i think i'm gonna like make a whole episode about that because I feel like I'm just going to go on forever. I'm going to go on a tangent and I don't want to right now. Um, but I watched an episode of my 600 pound life and the way that that poor woman, it was a woman in this particular episode was treated by everyone she encountered. Oh my gosh. I could, I only watched it because I wanted to make sure that I did have the understanding that I thought I did about what this show was going to entail. And it was absolutely disgusting um, how this woman was treated. People in larger bodies are still humans. And that doesn't get capped at 300 pounds. It doesn't get capped at 400 pounds. It doesn't get capped ever. Human. They are a human being. Okay. Just let's like, we all have these biases because that's our culture. Um, and just like sit with that for a second because it's, that's not okay. Yeah. And I would like to piggyback off that and just say, if you've, if you're listening to this and this is a lot to take in and you are like, man, I think my 600 pound life is, or, or like the biggest loser is, is great because it encourages people to lose weight. Like if you are just accessing this for the first time where you're just coming maybe to the realization or hopefully we're helping you come to the realization that this stuff is kind of harmful and kind of offensive and really like it hurts people's feelings uh and is not a good practice for us as human beings like we're not trying to mock you in any sense no not at all collectively oh my cat just jumped onto my desk um we're just <laughs> trying to uh inform and like get you on board with us and if, and the purpose of that is so that we stop offending people and we stop forgetting an entire population of yeah. marginalized people um, yeah. and by doing that continually mocking them and continually marginalizing them yeah, exactly taking a quick break from the episode to come in and give some clarification and corrections on a couple things that I had been saying earlier. Um, don't want to leave anything hanging or up in the air. A little fact check, if you will. Okay, so in regards to the National Weight Control Registry, participants have lost an average of 66 pounds and maintained the loss for an average of five and a half years. But in order to enroll, they need to have lost 30 pounds and maintain that loss for a year. And that information is available directly from their website and from a really great article I read on Today's Dietitian. All right, next thing to clarify, Victoria's Secret did in fact hire a quote unquote plus size model in 2019 uh, named Allie Tate Cutler. And the last thing is after eating a bowl of frosted mini wheats with 2% milk, more than half of adults had lower desire to eat than before breakfast for three and a half hours. I wasn't sure what that percentage was, but more than half. Now back to the show. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to talk about something known as thin privilege. I think the term privilege has really um, become much more well known. Um, after the Black Lives Matter movement started in 2020. Um, and so thin privilege certainly has um, a role in be, um, the oppression of Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, anyone who is not white, essentially. Um, but it's also kind of its own separate thing within this realm. Um, it, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So you may be wondering why I have a right to talk about these things because I'm thin. Um, and that is evident from my cover, cover photo of this podcast throughout my Instagram squares. And if you're watching this video on YouTube, you can tell. So I want to talk about that because I used to think that I had a right to these conversations because I had an eating disorder in college and because I gained weight at that time and I hated myself. And when I 
healed my relationship with food, kind of, enough to at least stop my eating disorder behaviors, and ended up losing some of the weight. Um, I still hated myself. And so I drew this conclusion that weight doesn't matter. So the thing that I missed and I will always have really deep regret for is that I've never been larger than a clothing size that's easily obtained at any clothing store. So I don't have the harm affecting me that affects so many other populations. And because of that, I've been centering the thin white ideal without realizing it because I never thought to look outside of myself, essentially. And I don't say this to ask for sympathy or to get praised. This is just a genuine thing that I've discovered. Um, Mostly within the last year, it has really become um, something I'm aware of and it needs to change. So I've pandered to an audience that is already perpetuating harm on BIPOC, disabled individuals, older individuals, and the LGBTQ. LGBTQ plus community. Um, And I am in no way, shape, or form saying that thin white women don't hate their bodies and are not affected by diet culture, because that is very true. The thing is that it's a much broader issue. And if I center myself and people like me, I'm hurting and not helping because it is easier to be thin and white than it is to be these marginalized populations. It doesn't mean I think I'm better. That's just, that's part of privilege. So the work is ever evolving and it's work that I will continue to do because this work will never be done. And in order to end fat phobia, we need to end racism. And we also need to end ableism and ageism and all the other things that we're unfairly perpetuating harm um, on populations for, and it's really necessary work. I would completely agree with your statement. I think you just did some good thesis work on this podcast and what uh, you're going to try to be diving into as we move forward. So, uh, yeah, Uh, and, and I would like to state, you know, Uh, That word privilege has become a buzzword, and sadly, it has not always been an accepted buzzword. I think it has Mm -hmm. been met with some contention to a degree. And if you're one of those people that uh, feels, you know, accosted when you hear that word, then I just suggest that you bear with us here. You send in questions, uh, you know, to this podcast, and we will cover them Um, and Also, like, I would like you to just try and confront some of these things because I can guarantee you, I, like, as a skinny, white, male, straight, I sit on a pedestal of privilege and it's, you know, I can hopefully help explain how that is and uh, get you to uh, realize it and... uh, move forward that way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, So the other thing about why I continue to have these conversations is that I am an eating disorder dietitian and I've devoted my professional and lots of my personal life to ending the harm that our culture is causing. And it's not just diet culture. Um, And I hope that that is being made a little bit more clear as we have this conversation. Um, It's essential to challenge the work of our biases and to dismantle diet culture um, and the other toxic cultures that exist, um, like white culture. (laughs) Um, And I want a safe space for honest conversation around why this work is necessary, because we can't talk about diet culture without talking about racism. Um, And I want to talk with people who have similar beliefs, but different lived experiences to share their takes as well. And that's why I'll be interviewing, um, lots of different people um, on this podcast. And part of why I have um, Nick's voice here too, just to represent a male perspective. Um, So I keep talking because I care. 
And because I want to positively represent dietitians in this arena, um, because we are the anti-diet and eating disorder, like genuine eating disorder helpers, not ones that just say they're healing eating disorders, but are actually promoting thinness because that's a, that is real. Um, but I want to highlight the work that we're doing because it matters and I'm going to keep going until things are shifting and I can't do it alone. So I hope that you hear this as a little bit of a call to action. Um, anyone who's listening, because I am so immersed in in this, in the work, and I still have work to do and will always. Um, I think that's part of being human um, and listening to what others have to say as well. Yes, I completely agree. Um, give me one. Th- Go ahead. Oh, I want to talk about why I'm so anti pursuing weight loss because I think because I do have thin privilege that it can kind of come across in a really like mm, like what does she know to say that I shouldn't pursue weight loss when she doesn't need to pursue weight loss um talk about that so our bodies have a set point weight which means that Well, first of all, they'll vary throughout your life because obviously when you're two years old, your set point weight will be you're growing. And then once you stop growing and you go through different courses of your life and different things, especially women, you're going to have many more opportunities um, that your body's going to shift. And so we're not meant to stay the same size forever. So when we say set point weight, Basically, the weight you are in high school and college for for many people is probably not the weight you're going to be forever. And so with that being said, when we cut out calories, which is our body's energy to function, and we cut out food groups and we exercise excessively, and when I say excessively, I mean more than you intend to do for like, let's just call it a five-year period of time. Like if, if it's something you're doing for the results it's probably excessive. Um, especially, so, especially if you hate it. Yeah. Like if you are actually hating yourself through your workout, I, I think maybe there's a different thing that could be done there. Yeah. And it, so these things will likely work at first. So there's a reason why like Weight Watchers, I'm, I'm going to pick on them. They're actually called Wellness Works now, but I have a real big issue with this company. And there's a reason they've been around for so long and keep evolving and making new programs. Like, shouldn't we be a little suspicious of that? So your body is going to allow this weight loss at first, right? We're in a calorie deficit that does matter. But then, especially when it's rapid, our body is going to be like, oh shit, I'm in a famine. I need to hold on to the weight so that I can't go through this again. Because if you think it's not been that many years since, and still, and, and again, this is me talking from a place of privilege because not all human beings on this planet right now actually have environments where they can like turn the air conditioning on or get running water or turn the heat on. Like that's, that's privilege. Um, and so our bodies have evolved, but still do these things to protect us. Um, and so your body's protecting you. It is functioning on lower and lower amounts of fuel because it's being adaptive. It's trying to save you. It's running efficiently. It's actually like a fucking miracle that our bodies do what they do. But because we live in a fat phobic society, we're like, oh no, I've ruined my metabolism. And now when you start to eat more, because you will, it's not about discipline. It's about your brain and your body ramping up to tell you you need to eat and you need to rest more. You're going to start eating more. And often it's going to come in the forms of really high energy foods, like things like potato chips and candy and ice cream and cookies, like high sugar, high fat foods, because they give you immediate high amounts of energy because that's what your body's craving. So 
then you feel out of control. Then we start blaming food. Then we say, oh, you're not sleeping enough or you're too stressed because you're gaining weight and it's all in your belly. And this is where I say that it was never going to work in the first place because when you're starving yourself, that's what's going to happen. And you may think, I'm not starving myself. But if you're purposely cutting food out and exercising more, you you are. And it makes food the bad guy. Food is not addicting. You don't have lack of self-control. Sometimes you have an eating disorder that can um, come from this and play a role. So I'm not saying that it doesn't feel like you have a lack of self-control, but it's because of the restriction. That is always going to cause a problem. Our bodies are so smart and they're going to ask for what they need. So we need to challenge what it means to be fat, what it means to be healthy, and what it means to be good enough because otherwise this shit is never going to stop. I agree. Um, I just wanted to chime in and say that you talk about labeling food an enemy, and uh, that is being done by a lot of us right now. I'm not saying there isn't room for growth with the food industry in a lot of terms, a lot of ways, but when you label food an enemy in the sense of, you know, I love it, but I should never eat it, Yeah, that is a slippery slope, my friend. Um, and, and that is like step one to disordered eating, um, so you know, just because, and I'm not, I'm not downing anybody. I say that as somebody who has fallen all the way down that slippery slope. So I'm right there with you. And it's not even just the physical restriction that causes this. It's, it's what Nick just said, the mental restriction of telling yourself that this thing is bad, that I shouldn't have it. That causes the same things to happen. Um, and a way I kind of relate this is we can all think of like being a teenager and being told not to do something makes you want to do it even more. There is a psychological component to restriction of anything and it causes us to want it. The thing is that food is not optional um, and no, no food. I don't care what it is. It's all food. Like Jolly Ranchers are food because they're sugar and sugar is carbohydrates which give you, which give you energy. So I know that's kind of hard to hear because we've labeled a lot of things that we can consume as not being necessary, as being quote unquote junk and garbage. Um, but if we come down to what it's actually made out of added, added chemicals and coloring or not, it is still food. Um, okay. So this is why, like all these things, healing your relationship with food and actively pursuing weight loss won't work in cohesion. So I have to be anti-diets. I'm not anti-dieter. I'm actually pro-dieter because I, I want to, and I don't even want to say like enlighten or like teach you because it's not like... I can make your life better by myself. Like, I'm not here to be like a self help guru. It's just that knowing the pain of having an eating disorder in the society, even from a thin body, like I said, like the point's not to center the thin white ideal here, but just knowing a taste of that and also watching it destroy lives because I'm in this field, I'm just like, passionately burning and yearning every day to have these conversations because even if it gives you this tiny seed of curiosity of like hmm and I've I've seen that in action like just a tiny little drop of anti-diet culture it can start to grow and it takes time but if you get to the other side of that it is better and that doesn't take away from the harm of all these overarching oppressions that take place. So that stuff has to be dismantled collectively as we on an individual level work on that healing. So I'm, I'm angry at this construct that enforces this and that compounds on all these other systemic oppressions. Um, and so 
when we are so consumed with like spending time looking at yourself in the mirror, trying to find clothes that most flatter your body, being as perfect as possible, as beautiful as possible, as thin as possible, it takes up. And then you're also in a calorie restriction. Your brain's not working. It is consumed. I'm not saying you can't go to work and you can't do your job because even people with like raging anorexia can still actually do a lot. It's really impressive. They're not good at a lot of things. They're really good at their eating disorders and they can still seem super functional. But it's because your brain is taken up by all this. And it's really distracting from a lot of other things going on. Um, Like when I was in my eating disorder, for example, I don't I didn't care about anything happening in the world. All I cared about was how fat I felt and how much I needed to fix that. That was it. So there's a lot of reasons why I care about healing diet culture. um, And it's individual and like a collective reason that I want this to to go away. It's painful. um, And it's painful on so many levels. Yeah, no, I just completely agree. Um, and that that is the goal is is to say um, of, of this podcast and of, of any of pointing the finger at any oppression. It's not to like attack or meme or yeah. say I'm better than someone. It's it's for the sole fact that I think, you know, oppression is like the most dangerous thing. And especially, you know, the people being oppressed, sometimes they oppress themselves and they can't even get out of this cycle. And I just think it's the saddest like most wasteful thing that we do with our time and so that's that's you know my goal is is to just say hey you know like that's this doesn't even need to happen it's literally senseless and and we can yeah these are like constructs that we've i mean they're built in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years deep but they were made up yes they're they don't exist they exist for purpose for a certain population but they don't need to I completely agree. And I hope that, you know, this newfound uh, knowledge that a lot of these things doesn't need to exist, hopefully is the first step in ridding ourselves of all of these silly constructs that actually keep us hating ourselves constantly. But, uh, but, but anyways, let's. uh... Yeah. So a common response, like I, I had mentioned this, like with the healthism with Twitter, Uh, to body acceptance is that it's promoting quote unquote obesity. I will only use that term because it's disgustingly a medical term. And it's something that we all have to be like on the same page about that, that like, that's why it's not because I want to, I, and not because I'm trying to pretend that it's not something that's, this isn't like a silver lining situation. It's because I actually think that that word shouldn't be in use, but I have to use it at times. So that's why I put certain things in quotes because I don't believe in them and I would never just use them outside of making a point. Um, So that that body acceptance, acceptance is promoting obesity. That argument needs to stop because first of all, the BMI scale is not an appropriate indicator of health. So the term obesity, which I use in quotes, is useless. There's evidence that people in larger bodies have higher instances of health conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and high cholesterol, but there is no evidence that this is caused by being fat. So there's a difference between correlation and causation, and there's evidence that weight stigma, which I'll explain in one second, is directly linked to causing some of these health conditions because when you control for other factors, when you actually do research appropriately, when you're not trying to just like make a point because it's being paid for by a company that has an agenda and you actually do the research properly because there is a standard for how research is done. um, If you like study science, it's, it's caused by weight stigma. So weight stigma is the way that society 
puts this pressure on people in larger bodies. So like saying exactly saying that, like if you like your body and you're fat, you're promoting obesity and you're promoting heart disease. Like that's the thing. So like you go to the doctor in an overweight body and that's always a conversation that's going to be had. Even if you're going for another reason, you actually often don't receive the same care and treatment as someone whose weight wouldn't be blamed for that problem. So that's one reason. And it actually keeps people from seeking health care a lot of times because they're sick of being told that it's because I'm fat. And that's not a reason to not get appropriate health care. Being told to go on a diet at the doctor's office is not helpful medical practice. And I know I'm not a doctor, but I stand by what I just said. And I always will. Um, So the other thing is that social determinants of health, um, like your socioeconomic status, how much money you make, what class, which is also disgusting, you live in, um, in our society, and then the color of your skin. Those things um, play a huge role in ability to get health care and to be treated ethically. Um, and this is why the movement and concept of health at every size is so crucial. So a lot of people, again, hear health at every size. You're saying that a fat person is healthy? No, I'm not. I'm also not saying that a skinny person is healthy. That's the point. You have the right to have access to health care no matter the size of your body. That does not revolve around how much you weigh. It's That's inappropriate. Um, because if you engage in health promoting behaviors like joyful movement, which is the term I use instead of exercise, because I don't think that we should be engaging in torturous um, movements of our body. I mean, I will say if you're training for something specific, I get that that's a little bit different, but just the general concept of that, unless you really love that and it's not torture, it's not joyful and that matters. Um, When you're pursuing like health promoting behaviors like joyful movement and eating a balanced diet which again also is a privilege to be able to eat a balanced diet because not everyone has access to a variety of foods um and like getting adequate sleep working on stress reduction again all things that are wrapped up in privilege because the more money that you have and the more access you have the more easily you can do these things which is again why we can't say that it's someone's personal decision what their body looks like on top of the fact that all bodies aren't supposed to look the same so there's a lot of layers going on here but when you when you pursue health promoting um activities your health can improve even if you don't lose weight. So like, hear that, reflect on that, listen to that, because we've been told the opposite forever and ever and ever, and it's actually not true. What if you're lying to me? Do you have any articles or anything that I can access as a listener that would further, you know, explain these topics? Yes. And I'm going to put some links in the show notes of this. I definitely like, I want people to do their own research. Um, and so I'm not putting art- article links in this to be like, this is the only thing you can read because there's going to be a lot of things that oppose what I say. It's just that the evidence for the things I am saying, it's good enough and consistent enough. And there's enough meta analysis, meaning this research has been done over and over and over and over, which actually is what has to happen to say that like, there's a general conclusion that can be drawn, which is something else that general articles on the internet like don't include. Um, but it, there's there's good stuff here, really promising things. And I know this is this is hard too because we all have our own personal experience, but I've seen it happen for people in real life. Um, and just because I know someone's gonna throw this at me at some point. Weight loss can improve health. Like it, it seems like it's connected. It just hasn't been proven that that's the reason. Because, like, what I'm saying is, like, if you start exercising and eating, quote unquote, better, like what society says, you may experience some weight loss and improved blood pressure, cholesterol, yada yada. 
But that can also happen if you don't lose weight. And so that's where it's not that the weight loss is connected, but it's not proven that that's the reason because health can still be pursued by someone regardless of weight loss. So I just want to make that very clear. Um, And also, I have a really, well, these are a lot of unpopular opinions. Pursuing health is a personal decision. So when someone says, like, that person is eating horribly and they're lazy and they're not, they're not healthy. I actually don't believe that anyone gives a fuck about their health. I think that's fat phobia at work. I I would like to go a step further and I'd like to say that it is um, unexamined fat phobia at work. Um, And I can go off on a quick tangent here if you will let me. Um, Go for it. Cool. So one of the things that really upsets me uh, right now, I feel like a large there's a large portion of the population that is, uh, you know, they're thinking very progressively and in a very humanist way in terms of a lot of these things. Right. We're talking about a lot of the concepts we talked about privilege, you know, uh, like we we need to be better in all these areas. And but a lot of the people I see in, in these similar schools of thought, they're 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 uh, proponents of some of these great humanist schools of thoughts, but then they they fall short. I think by attributing uh, being overweight to a lack of of willpower, or like you you're lazy, or you're you know something like that. And I I understand that we have this huge societal contract that construct that will is the direct reason for all of your success or failure in Mm. the country or like just for everybody. And I would highly discourage that thought and I would highly encourage you to try and view it in a different lens. Um, You know, we were talking, we're talking about medical issues uh, being caused by um, your weight. Um, You know, like a lot of people would say, a lot of people would in this category that I'm talking about would, think that somebody who's overweight deserves the medical repercussions yeah Um, and I think that's that's really sad because like you know I don't know how many people in my life I've seen to come to other medical issues that are just god awful I mean cancer what 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 did we you know what what who deserves cancer for you know what I'm saying not everything is something that you did to deserve that um, and even like, you know, if you if you have lung cancer because you smoked, a lot of people, yeah, you deserve that because you smoked. Well, what if my dad smoked and he made me smoke? What if, you know, what if I'm like in this sort of marginalization, you know, there's all of these, all of these other factors going on constantly with all these things that are so much deeper than just will. And so I would highly encourage you to not view it in this way. I would highly encourage you to stop that because I think it's detrimental. And if we do that, if we allow ourselves to consider our weights a direct product of our will, then we continue to marginalize and oppress that community of people who are could be genetically predisposed to be a certain way they, they they might be like there are so many reasons to be so many weights and right. it's so deep and complex it is not just laziness or not laziness that is not it i guarantee you i promise you there are no instances there are some instances in which people do put in a lot of work to get a lot of things and that is great and we can respect that but we also mm-hmm. have to make room for the understanding that that is not always the case and that people who don't put in work or whatnot also deserve just as good of a life and just as good of treatment on on social media and by their peers and that is my quick rant about that and that reminds me when I was talking about the things that impact health I didn't mention your environment because that's kind of like a no-brainer for me with socioeconomic status but a lot of marginalized populations are purposefully made to live in certain places and those places tend to have worse environmental repercussions um it's done on purpose by our society and that impacts your health so that's another way but basically to nick's point the oppressed do not cause their oppression 
And if that's hard to hear, I really encourage you to think about what feelings are you projecting that makes you happy that somebody like who smokes gets lung cancer? Like, why are we, what is that? What are we projecting? It's just like when someone's speeding down the interstate and they get pulled over by a policeman, which is a really complicated thing to even talk about because of um, everything that's going on with the police. And, but anyway, I'm kind of outside of that just like being happy that someone got pulled over by the police because they got caught speeding like why are we happy to celebrate people's detriment yeah Um, what are you projecting it's big time goofy and uh, you know as someone driving on the road who has been like oh someone's tailing me and then they pass me and then they get us i see them get pulled over i'm like yeah and i'm like no buddy that's not good you don't you don't want to see someone get a i don't $250 $250 speeding ticket and it no. hits their license point. It increases their insurance. It does a lot of detrimental things to people who don't make exorbitant amounts of money. Um, and I, that sentence I think is very applicable to a lot of the things that I, we we're talking about right now, but yeah. So I'm angry and I'm channeling my anger into this podcast Some of you listening are probably angry, too, and you're, like, yelling out, like, yes, girl, yes, dude. I don't know what they would say about Nick, but preach, right? Some of you are probably, like, what the fuck are they talking about? And that used to be me. You don't know things until you know them, and that's okay. So I just want to reemphasize, we're not here to yell at you, to tell you that we know best. We're here to share what we know from our lived experiences, from our education backgrounds, which again, that's privilege. I don't say that to be like, ooh, I'm better. Um, That's privilege. And hold space for others to share what they know and feel so that you can get really curious about what you've been told. And I hope that you just take one baby step in the direction of healing Uh, individually and as a society. So, do you want to add anything? Yeah, there? you know, you're angry and I would just like to say that I am sad and that is why I do this. And I am sad because I see so many beautiful people around me succumb and be forced um, into this way of thinking in which they constantly bully themselves and they hate their lives uh, because of some of these things and they miss out on so much because of it. And I'm not blaming them for that. I'm nope. just saying I really would love if uh, we could nip this in the bud in order to have everybody be able to enjoy the same kind of life that we think skinny people on the internet enjoy yeah because i think it's attainable agreed and it's going to take a lot of work as we wrap up and move forward some really important key concepts to know are weight stigma social determinants of health intuitive eating and health at every size um don't worry I'm going to explain these things as we move forward. There will be individual episodes on this and throughout the season, and there are common themes that are going to be discussed throughout this entire podcast. But in case you want to get a head start on exploring these, I'm going to include really great links in the description of this episode so that you can kind of fact check. Because when I hear something that I think sounds kind of crazy, I'm like, oh, let me get some backup on this. And I don't want you to take anything I say without a grain of salt. I want you to see where I'm coming from because I'm not just here spouting bullshit even though some people probably think that's the case because you just don't know what you don't know so thank you for listening thank you for caring and thank you for being open to growth until next time yeah thanks so much guys and 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 please again check out the resources hit us on the socials like be part of this especially if you disagree especially if you agree uh you know give us share how you feel about all these things with us and we can yell them from these microphones um yeah yeah so dietitian danny cast is my personal instagram handle and that's the place to go for what's going on with this podcast to reach out um also available on YouTube if you would prefer to watch instead of just listen moving forward. So um, Diet Culture with Danny Castellano. 
Um, Diet Culture is edited and produced by myself and Nick Lewis. Um, This podcast is not a substitute for individual advice from healthcare professionals. Um, I thank you very much and can't wait to talk to you guys soon. What's up, everybody? Wanted to chime back in with another fact check or rather a check yourself. Um, I candidly use the term overweight a few times in this podcast, and I think that is a very unfair and unjust term for me to be using. I think that is a term that carries a lot of baggage and also defines and measures one body compared to another based on an unfair and unreasonable standard of normalization that has been set up. And so I will be trying my best to eliminate that term from my vocabulary. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.